Hello everyone, Willie Logan here at Mare Island in North San Francisco Bay, California. Behind me is a U.S. Navy Polaris missile, the first submarine-launched nuclear missile. Let's take a look at this Cold War weapon. The Polaris missile story begins in the mid-50s. The nuclear arms race was on, and both the United States and the Soviet Union had already started building stockpiles of nuclear bombs and fleets of bombers to deliver them. They also had surface-to-air defensive missiles like the Nike Ajax to shoot down bombers carrying nuclear weapons. And they were developing intermediate-range and intercontinental ballistic missiles to deliver nuclear warheads directly to targets without the need for an airplane. In the mid-50s, the United States had four of these rockets under development, the Jupiter and Thor IRBMs and the Atlas and Titan ICBMs. Jupiter was an army project, while Atlas, Titan, and Thor belonged to the Air Force. But what about the Navy? The Navy had just started commissioning a fleet of nuclear submarines, which could stay submerged for extended periods without coming up for fuel or supplies. The USS Nautilus was the Navy's first such submarine. Launched in 1954, it made a highly publicized crossing of the North Pole under the Arctic sea ice four years later. If combined with nuclear missiles, a nuclear submarine could become the ultimate Cold War weapon, capable of striking the Soviet Union from anywhere at any time. President Eisenhower approved the development of a fleet-based nuclear missile in September 1955. The Navy's Special Projects Office started work on the missile, initially in collaboration with the Army Ballistic Missile Agency and its Jupiter Missile Program. But the Army-Navy collaboration lasted only a year. As envisioned at the time, Jupiter would be a large missile, 58 feet long and 105 inches in diameter, and weighing 160,000 pounds. This missile would be too big to launch from any existing submarines in the Navy's fleet, so the Navy would have to build a monster submarine to carry it. In addition, Jupiter would use liquid propellant, and the Navy was worried that it would be unsafe to use such volatile propellants in an enclosed ship under the surface of the ocean. On December 8, 1956, the Navy pulled out of Jupiter development to develop its own smaller solid propellant missile specifically for launch from submarines. The smaller missile was called Polaris. The Navy's Special Projects Office developed the missile, while Lockheed Missiles and Space Division built the airframe at a huge new factory in Sunnyvale, California. Aerojet General made the rocket motors, and General Electric produced the internal guidance system. Polaris was small enough to launch from existing submarine classes with modifications. Two recent technological changes enabled the Navy to make this missile. One was that solid propellant rockets had started to come of age. Thanks to the use of a rubberized bonding agent, solid propellant grains were now stable, safe to handle, and resistant to changes in temperature and humidity which had caused older propellant grains to crack and explode on ignition. The other change was a decrease in the size of nuclear warheads. Jupiter had been designed for the warheads of the mid-50s, but the size of nuclear warheads was steadily decreasing. Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb, encouraged the services to design missiles for the warheads of the future. Why use a 1958 warhead in a 1965 weapon system, he said. There was no need for a 160,000-pound missile to launch these new warheads. A 30,000-pound missile would be sufficient. Developing a submarine-launched nuclear missile came with its own distinct technical problems. One of these was how exactly to launch the missile from a submerged submarine. After considering various alternatives, the Navy's Special Projects Office decided to launch the missile by compressed air. The missile would rise toward the surface, surrounded by bubbles, shoot above the surface, and fire its first stage in the air above the sea. 
The Navy and Lockheed conducted a series of tests to determine the feasibility of launching Polaris from a submarine. One of the tests, at the San Francisco Naval Shipyard, tested the compressed air launching system. Dummy missiles made of redwood logs were fired out of an underwater missile launch tube. This was called Operation Pea Shooter. A more elaborate test involved launching full-scale missile mock-ups and catching them with the Hunter's Point Crane, a prominent landmark in southern San Francisco. This was called Operation Skycatch. Lastly, Operation Pop-Up, conducted at San Clemente Island near San Diego, launched an actual missile with a small propellant charge from a launch tube 200 feet underwater. Starting in September 1958, full-scale Polaris test vehicles were launched from ground-based pads at Cape Canaveral. Subsequent test vehicles flew from simulated launch tubes and a surface ship, USS Observation Island. Finally, on July 20, 1960, the first Polaris was launched from a submerged nuclear submarine. The ship was USS George Washington, a nuclear submarine with a missile bay in its center section. Shortly after this test, the first iteration of Polaris, A-1, deployed to the fleet. It was 28 feet 6 inches in length and 54 inches in diameter, and it weighed 28,800 pounds. It carried a single nuclear warhead and had a total range of 1,200 nautical miles. This Polaris is the A-2, first deployed in 1962. It is 31 feet in length and weighs 32,500 pounds. Its range is 1,500 nautical miles. It's a two-stage rocket, with solid rocket motors in both stages. This is the first stage. Although there are four nozzles at the back of the first stage, there's only one propellant grain. This is because the four nozzles are shorter than a single large nozzle would be, making the missile easier to fit into a submarine. The skin of the first stage is thick and heavy, as it needs to be because it's a solid rocket combustion chamber. Above the first stage is the interstage, which holds the two stages together. And above that is the second stage. Like the first stage, the second stage also has a single motor with four nozzles. The transition section in the nose holds the Mark I, the General Electric Guidance System. The cylindrical nose cone at the very top is the reentry vehicle, where the single megaton class W47 nuclear warhead was contained. Polaris A2 was followed by the A3 a substantially redesigned missile that carried not one, but three nuclear warheads, each with its own reentry vehicle. The warheads would impact about a mile apart from each other, which meant that an anti-ballistic missile couldn't take out all three warheads at once. The missile's range was 2,500 nautical miles, which could cover the entire Soviet Union. The Polaris missile was just one part of the Fleet Ballistic Missile Weapon System, which also included the Fleet Ballistic Missile Submarines. The FBM submarines were all nuclear-powered, so they could stay submerged for long periods of time. They carried inertial guidance systems that allowed them to know their position without surfacing, although these systems had to be calibrated to external references on a regular basis. Ultimately, there were 41 Polaris-carrying submarines launched, each armed with 16 missiles. The submarines are interesting in their own right, so maybe I'll make another video about them someday. The Polaris missiles and their submarines were remarkable pieces of engineering, and it's easy to geek out about them, as I totally have while making this video. But there's something else that I need to emphasize here. Polaris missiles were offensive weapons.
As their guidance systems were not especially accurate, they were designed to strike Russian cities, not military targets. Polaris missiles were intended to be deterrents, ready at all times, but used only in retaliation for a first strike by the Soviet Union. Of course, they never were used against the city, but if they had been, the results would have been devastating. The U.S. Navy's Polaris missiles have been retired since 1981. But submarine-based nuclear missiles are still very much in operation. The number of submarines and missiles are limited by international treaty. But decades after the end of the Cold War, the U.S. Navy still has 14 ballistic missile submarines, each armed with 20 of these beautiful and terrible weapons.